Good morning, everyone. What a beautiful day. When we got here, the first service, it was like 48 degrees, and all the heaters are blasting, and now we're all like shedding all of our jackets and clothes. We have this uh, wonderful shade above us. Those of you at home, if you've ever come, we have this great shade to keep us out of the sun and keep the, the rain from us. We're so grateful for all the volunteers and others who made it possible so we can continue to worship here um, outdoors. And we just said this great proclamation from the Apostles' Creed, one of the great creeds that our, our church a- adheres to. And it's pointed to this future where we proclaim that Jesus, he shall come again and one day will come to judge the quick and the dead, the, the living and those who've already gone uh, to, to be uh, with the Lord. And we will be uh, gathered again in this life everlasting we are promised. And so scripture, as we remind ourselves as we come to the table today, a point to this future when sin and its effects will be fully undone. It's a, the end of the story when King Jesus returns, he eradicates all the wrongs on this planet. And aren't there a few that need eradicating? He, ro- he eradicates all the wrongs in ourselves. And we continue to need his grace in our lives. And on this one day, we have this renewed heaven, a renewed earth. We don't know exactly what it's going to be like, but we get this little picture, some glimpse of his glory and his goodness, and God will somehow be uh, present with us on this new heavenly earth. And there'll be no more tears and no more crying. There'll be no more cancer, no more COVID, no more elections, no more divisions. And we'll be worshiping God face to face. And then until that day, so we get to as the people of God, that's today and every day moving forward. We have to live each moment giving our neighbors, our communities, our world a glimpse of God's love, of God's grace until he comes again. That is our job description until our very last breath. And so though sin still pervades our daily lives, We can see it on the news as well. We demonstrate God's victory over sin at the cross by living sacrificial lives empowered by the Holy Spirit, filled with joy as we care for the needy and we feed the hungry and we heal diseases and we offer grace to those burdened by guilt. You see, God's church gives a preview of this future reality as we love God and as we love neighbor. And so that's some of you noticed in the parking lot before you came, we're packing boxes. We're helping Martha Henry's food pantry. That's because of your support that people who are hungry, veterans and families, we're di- we were dividing up, you know, large volumes of stuff into smaller bags so people can get fed. And it's because of you during the last several months that we were uh, feeding people on Wednesdays, that the, not just hundreds, but like thousands of meals went out with your support. And we continue to do things like that. Your regular giving helps support missionaries around the world and near and far and right here in our community. That's what we do until he comes again. We give a glimpse of God's grace, God's love, God's goodness until he comes again. That's a great job description. That's what we get to do into our very last breath. So we've been studying Paul's letter to the Colossians, particularly mainly this chapter one. And we have been looking and seeing Paul's heart for these young Christians in Colossae. And he wanted them to not be thwarted with wrong thinking that would stunt their growth. There's this beautiful poem in chapter one, verses 15 to 20. We've read it almost every week. And then this beautiful poem, Paul points the Christian's attention heavenward to the glory of God, the eternal word of God, who is the creator, Paul says, of all things. And then he gives this creator a name, Jesus Christ, whom all things hold together. That's verse 17. So Paul is reminding them, reminding you, if you have Christ, Christ will personally hold your life together if you give your life to him. The same way that he holds the universe together, he wants to hold your life together in him. So let me ask you, have you surrendered to him? Have you invited him in? Have you said, I'm going to stop trying to hold my life together without you, Jesus? I surrender. I need you, Jesus, at the center of my life. And if you'll say yes to that, we invite you to partake in the table, the bread and the cup that we'll do after the sermon today. Jesus, be the center. Jesus, be my Lord. I give up. I'm powerless without you. I need you to hold all things together because they aren't holding together well without you, Jesus. What an invitation. 
And yet, even as he gives that invitation, he reminds us at the end of that poem to look not just heavenward, but earthward to Jesus, his work on the cross, his giving his life as an ultimate act of love. And so the truth of the whole letter of Colossians, but the truth of the gospel is that God the Father sends the Son on a rescue mission. That's the words that Paul is using. He is rescuing you. That, and you should look for his salvation from this rescue mission where proclaiming God's reign on this mission. Jesus accomplished the mission by hanging on a cross. He washes our stain. He bears our burden and he pays our debt. And that's all called this big word, justification, that we've been learning the last few weeks. And then Jesus, by his Holy Spirit, is the one in charge of our growth, our ongoing growth. That's a big word called sanctification. And in the midst of this justification and sanctification, we are to purposely partner with God in this growth. That's verses 28 and 29. That God does want you to grow, but don't do it without him. You need him, particularly you need his Grace. And so today we're going to look at how Paul opens and closes his letter to Colossians. And he uses these two words. It's the only two words we're going to talk about really today. It's grace and peace. Grace and peace. First of all, verse two again. Paul says, Grace and peace from God our Father. Now, this is a typical way that Paul opens and closes every one of his letters. They're also called epistles these letters to either leaders or churches or both leaders and churches. See, but why, we ask, why these two words were Paul's opening and closing in every single letter? Well, these are essential truths to Paul because without them, we can never experience the reconciliation with God and, we, and with each other that Paul talks about in verse 20. This rescue mission is possible because of God's grace and peace. Now, Paul only uses the word peace Three times in this letter, in Colossians 1, verse 2, Colossians 1, verse 20, in Colossians 3, 15, which says this, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. By the way, another name for the Eucharist, the Lord's Supper, is thankful. <laughs> Eucharisto, being, giving thanks. Be thankful. Now, Paul uses this word for the word rule. In the Greek, it's brabeo, and that means to rule. And that refers to the context, the athletic games that the Colossians would have known. And in the athletic games, they needed an umpire who would judge a conflict. What was right, what was wrong, was out of bounds, in bounds, an umpire. Paul says, you need to cease living in fear of angels and demons, is what the Colossians are worried about. These kind of mystical, spiritual experiences. They're worrying about, how do I know if I'm close to God? Paul says, you don't need to worry about that. That is not the, the, the litmus test for your closeness to God, this fascination with angels and demons. Neither li live in fear to legalism. A legalism which said you must, you must prove your worthiness of God's love. You must prove that you're good enough to get the God of grace in your life. Paul says, no, 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 no. Let the God of peace rule your heart. Let that be the umpire. Let that be the judge, not your fear. And so we're going to invite God's peace in our lives 2,000 years later. God, we need your peace to shape our thoughts about our frayed relationships. Anyone have a frayed relationship going on? <laughs> Just bring up the election. Then you have a frayed relationship, right? Anyone have a frayed relationship? God says, I'm, I want you to have peace. I want you to have peace over the cancers that you or your family members or friends are experiencing. I want you to have peace about the bitterness that can sometimes be in you. And Paul is saying, don't let bitterness rule your heart. Let peace rule your heart. Don't let bitterness rule your mind because it'll keep you in a prison of resentment. Let peace rule in your heart, in your mind, and you'll be free experiencing God's grace and sharing it with others. And then Paul later says in Philippians 2, verse 7, he wants you to have a peace that surpasses all understanding that will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. This word peace is so important to Paul. He opens his letter saying, grace and peace to you. Anyone need peace? I need it. God, I need your peace. I got friends sick in the hospital. I need your peace. I have friends struggling financially. I have friends struggling with jobs. I, I, you probably have some people like that too. 
Or maybe you're here right now. You need God's peace. Oh, we're praying for you at, right now that you would experience a peace that surpasses all logic, a peace that penetrates in the midst of your circumstances that are overwhelming. We're praying for that peace that Paul talks about. You know, C.S. Lewis, a great writer, author, says this, God cannot give us a happiness and a peace apart from himself because it is not there. There is no such thing. The only peace that is lasting, the only peace that ultimately works is found in Jesus alone. You can't find this peace in Buddhism. You can't find this peace in legalism. You can't find this peace in humanism. And you can't even find this peace in Presbyterianism. Oh, no. No, it's only in Jesus that you find the peace that surpasses all understanding, a peace that will rule your heart and mind, not fears, not bitterness, ruling your hope and mind, ruling your mind, eradicating hope. No, it's God's peace. Ephesians 2.14 says it very clearly, for he, Christ himself, is our peace. And then Paul says early in Colossians 1, 6, he says this, he says, you heard and understood the grace of God in truth. He transitions us from the peace and now to the grace. See, Paul says the gospel has been growing in the lives of the Colossians as they heard and understood God's grace. See, because wrong beliefs about God and wrong beliefs about the gospel are in opposition to what God desires to do in his children to embrace the formation, to embrace the growth that comes from God's grace. So we're going to spend the rest of our time talking about God's grace. And the first thing is I'm going to warn you about three potential wrong beliefs about grace. The first one is a wrong belief about the God of grace. See, one of the biggest obstacles to our growth is our view of God. See, if we are going to grow in relationship to God, then we must know who God is and what he's really like. And if we see God wrongly as a cosmic Santa Claus, I use that term all the time, then we'll perform for him because he always knows who's naughty and who's nice, right? I got to clean up my act. I got to balance out the scales. Well, friends, that's not Christianity. That's called Eastern mysticism or karma, There are no scales to balance in your life. You don't add a little good to balance out the bad. That's karma. That's not Christianity. Christianity says you are saved by grace. It's done. There are no scales anymore. You're saved by grace. You will not get weighed based on your righteousness, but on Christ's righteousness in you. That's a whole nother sermon we need to preach. You see, if we see God as this cosmic Santa Claus who's looking for who's naughty and who's nice, we end up with this false thinking that we can manipulate God or the cosmic forces, if you're not a Christian yet, the cosmic forces uh, into bringing some kind of blessing into my life because I deserve it, because I've been good, Santa. I've been good, cosmic karmic forces. I've been good. I planted a tree. I I planted a tree. So good karma will come to me. That's not the gospel. It's not how life works. You see, you might see God as a tyrant, which results in you trying to appease God by your morality or God as his cosmic Santa Claus that you can impress or coerce through any other of the isms out there, right? You see, any path that's outside of Jesus is pursuing some form of legalism, trying to prove to someone you're good enough or not bad enough. I mean, you're trying to prove something to someone. You see, that's the wrong view of God. God is not a Santa Claus with a lift who's naughty and who's nice. He's not some kind of like unnamed force out there of, of good or bad. You have to earn through karma. No, it's none of that. The Bible says we're all naughty and none of us are nice. The Bible says the creator who holds all things has a name and it's not a tree, it's not a rock, and it's not the universe. It's Jesus Christ, the king. He has a name and it's only through him that you will find peace and you can receive the grace that you need. See, this is actually good news because it means that God's love does not depend on your efforts that's good. It all depends on Christ's efforts on the cross for you. 
We must know that God is a God of grace. That's the first thing. Secondly, wrong beliefs about the gospel of grace. This is very much related. See, most of our friends and family think they understand Christianity, but what they actually know is religion, not the gospel. And even as Christians, I've been saying, we can wrongly think the wrong things about Christ and his gospel. We can start believing uh, that as we come to faith in Christ, that we can grow by trying really hard and trying to live more according to the Bible. If I just get my life aligned, I could just work harder, work harder. See, but the gospel of grace not only introduces you to God, but the gospel of grace is how you grow in God. You grow in him through the gospel of grace. It's not just a one-time deal. See, our non-Christian friends think that following the gospel is simply to become more moral, a better person. See, but the gospel of grace is all about humans made in the image of God and reclaiming who we were meant to be in Christ. You see, you, knew, you need grace to become a Christian and you need grace as you grow as a Christian. The gospel is not becoming more moral or a better human being, but it's about being connected to this God of grace so that you can be free to love him and to love others, which is really who you are always meant to be. Thirdly, See, what keeps you from growing is a wrong belief about the God of grace, a wrong belief about the gospel of grace, and lastly, a wrong belief about your standing in grace. See, verses 13 to 14 says that God has rescued you from darkness. It's a, it's a rescue mission, Paul says, that there's no room in the gospel for you to believe that you were the one in charge. God, pa- Paul almost gives a picture as if you were d- drowning in the water and you didn't dog paddle to Jesus to get saved. No, you already drowned and then Jesus comes and he resuscitates you from death. That's the salvation gospel of grace story. You didn't even doggy paddle to God. He had to lift your lifeless dead body out and bring life into death. You were utterly helpless in need of a rescue. See, this is where I think our friends in AA have it right. Our friends in Alcoholic Anonymous and all the 12-step groups, which started as a Christian movement, by the way, if you didn't know the history. And the first thing they say in AA groups is, I am powerless to overcome my addiction. And you know, one of the worst things you can do for someone who is powerless is tell them to change something about their situation where they are powerless. It's a terrible place to be. And I, I, I knew this firsthand at a much smaller level. I was at UCLA. I went home there Thanksgiving to see my parents. And as I went home, of course, they went to check in on their son and wasn't, wasn't the uh, lady killer in uh, high school. So they're wondering if I'd found a girlfriend yet, any luck in that area. I hadn't had any luck yet by Thanksgiving. Give me a few, give me a little time, mom and dad. It's only been a couple months. And sometime during the course of that visit, I was in the kitchen. I didn't have my shirt on just because it's with my mom and dad. No big deal. And my mom does this. She looks at me, looks up, looks down, up again. She says, you should start working out. And then just walks away. Okay. (laughs) How rude. How rude. Mom. You know what I did? I started working out. I started working out for the next six months. I got fit. I was in the UCLA gym. You know where that is. My friend right here, she knows it. And I was working out. I got fit. You know what happened after six months? Absolutely nothing. Not one girl (laughs) wanted to hang out with me. Okay. You know, here's the deal. Legalism will always try to tell you work harder. Even Eastern missuses will tell you, if you want to balance out the karmic forces, you got to work harder. you got to do something. But the fact is, we're powerless. A holy God, an imperfect human being, we're powerless. We need someone to bridge the gap, a rescue mission. And Jesus, the king himself, came. The one who holds all things together, says, I'm going to put you back together because of him and his grace. See, the gospel says you must turn to Christ who offers a love you can't earn and a love you can't lose. And so as one loved by a God of grace, you relish in the fact that you are saved and sanctified because of the gospel of grace and you are secure because of your standing in grace. And see, God's formula for growth has at its core its primary ingredient of that word again, grace. It's at the center of everything. You are powerless even to make any lasting change without the God of grace. 
Paul says it so clearly in Titus 2, verses 11 through 12. He says, the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. There's a salvation part. Training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in the present age. That's the sanctification part. You see, friends, the grace that saves us is also the grace that changes us. Anyone here want to grow in some way? You need the God of grace. You need grace in your life to grow. Or else it's just going to be legalism. Or else it's just going to be you trying to balance out the karmic forces. It's a never-ending battle until you lean into the God of grace. See, Philip Yancey, author, writer, says it this way. Grace is not dependent on what we have done for God, but rather what God has done for us. Ask people what they must do to get to heaven, and most reply, be good. Jesus' stories contradict that answer. All we must do is cry, help! You know, Jesus welcomed saving faith no matter who it was or when it was. You know, you remember that story, if you've read the Bible before Jesus, he's crucified, and he's crucified with the criminal on his right and on his left. These are convicted criminals. Jesus was falsely convicted. Here he is dying between the two. One criminal is hurling insults at Jesus. I mean, can you imagine how much bitterness you must have in your heart? While you're dying, you're throwing insults still. The other thief, though, the criminal says, shut up. Why are you bothering this man? He's done nothing wrong like us. And then he says to Jesus, this criminal, guilty, the end of his life, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus takes the time to say, today you will be with me in paradise. That's grace. The criminal didn't get his act together. He didn't turn his life, didn't give a dime to a synagogue or a church. Didn't go in our Presbyterian new members class, though it's a good one. <laughs> he just said, Jesus, don't forget me. I surrender, help. Paul says in Romans 5, 8 and 6, 23, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. You know what my main role is as a pastor? My main role is a funeral director, okay? Listen to this. It's not always just literally doing funerals. My job is to proclaim that there are things in your life that just need to be dead. Not only giving up the things that are blatant sins, my job is to help you see that your wrong view of God needs to be dead that he's not a cosmic Santa Claus. He's not some cosmic force working with karma in your life to make you into a better human being. He, I need to proclaim that your wrong view of the gospel needs to be dead, that it's not about receiving Jesus one time and then trying hard to be a good enough person, or at least not so bad that God's gonna look badly on you. It doesn't work that way. And finally, your wrong view of your standing with God needs to be dead. You see, because you're powerless to change yourself, but you have a God of grace on your side who has gone to great lengths to pour his love into you and wants to pour it through you. You need this God of grace. You could be a Christian beginning today or Christian for 50 years. You never outgrow your need for God's grace. Author Jerry Bridges says it this way. He says, your worst days are never so bad that you are beyond the reach of grace and your best days are never so good that you're beyond the need of God's grace. We are always in debt to God, but he calls it a free gift. He says, that debt that was owed is paid by my own son. No more scales will be counted against you because you've been forgiven and declared righteous, the Bible says. You get Christ's righteousness because of his grace. Colossians 4.18, Paul says this. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my chains. And then he says, grace be with you. I'm going to leave you with one more thought about God's grace. My daughter Avery's here today. She's a real do-it-yourselfer. She's a cook and 
baker and does amazing stuff. And so um, I've always been a little self-conscious because ever since she's been born, I've been taking pictures with her and you have like her beautiful skin next to my like not beautiful skin because it's like a hereditary thing and my dad has the same thing, but it's so stark. Now everyone's looking at it. Just zoom in on your phone at home and zoom in on all my little marks on my face. So Avery made me this face cream, homemade, and she says, put this on every night and it's going to help. So she made it for me the other day. So I put it on, sleep in it. I wake up and she says, did you put it on? I'm like, yeah, I put it on. I'm like, how do I look? <laughs> She's like, dad, it doesn't work that way. It's only been one day. You need to do it at least 30 days. Like it's only one day. It doesn't work that way, dad. But you know what? I do that with God all the time. God, I, I, I need to change. Change me. It's gonna take time. Listen to the words of wisdom from Avery. It's going to take time, but it's because you're leaning into God's grace. It's not just a one-time thing. You lean into God's grace. You see, God's grace gets us immediately imparted to us. Yes, when we repent and surrender our lives to Jesus, absolutely, it's done. But growing in grace takes time. So don't wrongly think that you don't need God's grace today. You do, every one of us. God's grace isn't just for salvation, but it's also for sanctification. Jesus says this in Matthew 10, verse 8. He says, freely you have received, now freely give. Because the reality is, friends, that saved people serve people. Perfect love never hoards, always shares. When you experience the grace of God, you want to share it. When you experience the grace of God, you want to grow in it, and you want to give it away. Because save people, serve people. You know, well, my wife Katie and I were struggling for years to get pregnant with our second child. We already had Avery, but years went by. We weren't getting pregnant. Then God blessed us with a little surprise called Grayson. That's my youngest daughter. We named her Grayson to remind us that she was a total surprise, a total gift of God. And it was just her birthday last week. She's a big seven-year-old now, okay? Don't you forget it. She's seven. And so she would remind you that she is seven. And at the day of festivities were done. She'd gone to bed already. She'd got all these wonderful gifts. And then she comes out of bed and comes to me while I'm working on the sermon, typing this par- paragraph right here. She comes out, and I'm like, what is it now? She's like, I just wanted to give you another hug. I'm like, oh, my goodness. So I give her a hug. And I say, you know, Grayson, you're my gift. I said, you know, Grayson, I have a love for you that grows bigger every day because that's what happens when you love someone. You know, here's the thing. For those who receive the grace of God through faith in Christ, we experience a love that, that seems to grow every day. And here's the reality is that when we're, we are joined to this eternal God by grace, through faith in Christ, who is perfect love. And our current bodies can't contain all the love he has for us. And our current minds can't comprehend his beauty and holiness. And so when we've had a million years of bliss on this new heavenly earth, seeing God face to face, I believe God's going to look at us and say, we're just getting started on ending perfect love. Every day, into eternity, capturing a little bit more of this unending person of love, of grace, of goodness. And until he comes again, we get the great privilege of letting that grace leak out of us to a world that is thirsty and hungry for some grace. But you can't do it on your own. You need this God of grace every single day until he comes again, loving him, loving others in our everyday lives. And so I want you to come to the table with that thought. This is a table of grace. And as you get your bread and cup out, we'll take this together. I want you to remember that you and I didn't deserve to have a holy God to take on our sin, but he did. And he didn't only become sin for us, as the Bible says, but in exchange, he gifts us his righteousness by grace through faith. See, that's why, because of this 
thing that Jesus has done, this great exchange, I can look at you right now and I can say with confidence that all who have repented and confessed Jesus as Lord, that you cannot out sin God's grace. It's done. He's stronger than you. He's faster than you. He's bigger than you. You can't outdo God. Your salvation is not dependent on your performance. Your doubts don't drive away his divine love. So we come to the table with confidence that you're only beginning to experience and understand the immense love of God that is present with us right now. We believe somehow as we partake of the bread and cup, somehow by the power of the Holy Spirit, we experience this God of love, God of grace in a special way together as we partake in the supper. Would you please join me in a prayer? Lord, our hearts ache for a world in desperate need of grace. Lord, we ask that your broken body, your poured out blood, remind us that you, Jesus, gave your life so that we could be reconciled to you and to one another. Would you forgive us for the ways that we have hardened our hearts? Would you show us how to be ambassadors for Christ as vessels of grace? And when we give a broken world a glimpse of your goodness until you come again, and Lord, we know you will come because you're good to your word. And so we approach this table with our hearts humble, confessing our sins, Lord. Forgive us for times doubting you and your grace. Empower us now as we partake of these elements. We believe this, Lord, in your name. Amen.